Okay. Uh, I have seen that Marcel has joined. Yes. Hello, everyone. Perfect. So seems like we are all with the full house. Mm, so the attendees are going to be joining us from both Zoom and LinkedIn because we are uh, going live on LinkedIn and, and on Zoom. And I just see my daughter is raising hand. So hello. Uh, so let's start with the um, brief intro. I have promised my speakers that I will take not more than five minutes of, of this time. So the rest of the time, the, the floor belongs to them. So uh, let me very, very uh, warmly invite you to this um, Bulletproof CTO webinar that I uh, came up with a while ago and I just really wanted to make it happen. So I'm really, really glad that you guys have joined and kind of uh, devoted your time to, to, to help me uh, with this initiative. Uh, it's going to be regular from now on. Uh, it will be, I would believe, um, every two months. Uh, specifically, my plan is to then make it uh, industry um, narrow. So at the end of the webinar, uh, I will ask the attendees to, to vote on uh, which domain they would like to have the next webinar, because I really value your, your opinion. And um, just to let you know, this uh, webinar is kind of sponsored, I would say, by the power of LinkedIn networking, because I have never, ever seen any of those speakers face to face. So I was really close with Roy. I, I almost met him in Riga uh, at FrontCon conference, but surprise, surprise, the COVID came and, uh, well, uh, nothing came out of it. Um, so uh, we only know each other, let's say. From, from LinkedIn and to those of you who do not know me, uh, but you should, mm, I am the head of growth at Codes. Um, what we do, we are pretty much Ruby on Rails and JavaScript uh, a software engineering company doing both uh, team extension and uh, product development from scratch. Mm, then uh, I would be handing over the floor to uh, those great speakers you have here. So. In the order of uh, uh, that you see on the slide, I would ask uh, all of you guys to introduce uh, yourself, starting from Egle, and we are uh, ready to go. Hey, hello, everyone. I'm Egle Radvile. I'm Vilnius City Municipality CTO. I'm responsible in the city uh, to create technology and digital strategy, but also I'm responsible that everyone every citizen in the city could feel comfortable with digital transformation. So here I am. Perfect. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm Bastian. Since uh, five months, direct, one of the directors of engineering at Deliver Hero, and uh, in there responsible for the consumer ordering product uh, for most of uh, Asia Pacific, Eastern Europe and Northern Europe. It's called Pandora. So if some of you might know the, the brands Foodora and Food Panda. That's actually what, what we built. Um, yeah, and before that, so I was in tech management since 2007 and different companies like Immobilien Scout and Omeo and uh, saw different, different sides of what tech is all about, let's say. And I'm quite happy to be here today. Thank you, Bastian. Hey, uh, my name is Mendoes Mozuras. I lead engineering at Vinted. Vinted is a secondhand marketplace and we became Lithuania's first uh, unicorn at the end of last year. There are more than 200, 210 people in our engineering team and we are on a fast growth path since we grew from more than 100 at the start of this year and are doubling our team for the third year in a row. Uh, we are currently located in Vilnius, Lithuania, and we were work, working in a co-located office until the COVID hit. And since then, we've been working uh, mostly from home. Hi, my name is Sebastian Gamski. I'm a CTO of a company named Gamius. We come from Poland and we are a research and development company. Uh, which works on mainly on measuring and analyzing uh, how people do consume all kinds of digital media. So internet, but also linear or non-linear TV, even radio. Uh, so we process petabytes of usage data and apply advanced uh, data specific techniques. 
uh, to generate insights on people preferences and interests uh, segmented on, on by their demographic profile characteristics. Uh, currently, we have an engineering team of uh, nearly 50 people. These are mainly backend developers working in uh, C++ and Python on data processing on our internal data lake. Uh, before the pandemic, we work mainly uh, from the office, just one location. So for us, it was a big shift. And in March, we've moved completely towards the remote only model. Will we go to Roy? Hi, so my name is Roy Dirks. I'm from uh, Vanderbron in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So uh, Vanderbron is a company that um, is supplying Netherlands, uh, the market in the Netherlands with uh, green energy, like full, completely renewable energy. And over there, we're working with a, about a team of uh, 30 engineers, uh, now mostly from home. Uh, and yeah, ready to share some insights with you today. All right, then uh, thanks all. Uh, to finish this round, um, I'm Marcel, uh, founder and CTO of uh, Taledo. Uh, we digitalize recruiting by uh, having uh, one platform that allows you to manage, attract, and interview candidates all on one platform. And in addition to that, you also have our own candidate database where we have like a matching engine going on um, and our own like experts that can curate you throughout the process. Um, actually, it's built, it's built on Rails, uh, so <laughs> I found it interesting like, to hear that I'm not the only one this round, so that's great to hear always. Before that, um, I was um, head of IT with Pay11. They have now some, uh, exited to sum up. And um, yeah, we are bootstrapped, so uh, the total team size of our team is 50 right now, engineers 10, and we plan to also increase this heavily next year. Uh, perfect, uh, thank you. <laughs> Everyone, I have just uh, in the background launched a poll to ask the uh, attendees uh, what would be the best way to describe themselves. Hey, uh, so um, in a moment we will know more or less to who you guys are talking to. So kind of to get you this this feeling. Uh, and um, just before I switch to the first to the first uh, question, yeah, I'm again saying hey to my daughter on the chat. Uh, and the, the, the fun fact I was about to, to, to share, I already, I already shared with, with me Douglas, but we have this thing in Poland that uh, all the female name, names end with A, like my, my daughter is Iga, my wife is Agnieszka, so hello. And some time ago, I figured out that they have the same thing or at least a similar thing in Lithuanian. So all the uh, male names end with S. And then I was about to invite me Douglas to, uh, to the webinar. And I, I had this, hold on a second moment. I figured out that 95% of my contacts from Lithuania, I mean the guys, both their first name and second names end with S. So here's the fun fact that nobody needed, but everyone uh, fights it for. <laughs> so having that said, uh, I will gladly move to the first round of questions. And let me just check the poll because we still miss eight uh, votes. So I will maybe, okay, seven votes missing. I will uh, share this poll in a moment. So let's start with the first round of questions and we are moving to the agenda. We have uh, introduced ourselves. So thank you for that. Uh, so the first question would be the what category, as I kind of describe it. So we are interested to know what were the key issues and challenges that you personally and your engineering teams had to deal with when the COVID hit. So something that obviously nobody was expecting and nobody was ready for it. Let's let's be let's be serious. <laughs> so uh, that would be the the thing that uh, we would start with. Then the second round would be how, so how you tackle those problems. And uh, let's say we have six months from the outbreak. So half a year we have managed to uh, adjust to, to the situation. So then we end up with the lessons learned and the key takeaways that should be useful for the for CTOs and engineering managers for 2021, because we kind of still need to live in this reality. Uh, uh, 
Q&A session. Um, I will be collecting the, the questions from chat here and, and my colleague is collecting the, the questions from the LinkedIn event. So those questions that will be specifically to any of the speakers, I will ask the speakers to, to reply. If there will be open, uh, open questions, I will just ask it and feel free to volunteer. Uh, if there will be too many questions, I promise that uh, we will, you know, uh, I will ask my speakers to answer me uh, for those questions within a couple of days, not to, uh, not to take too much of their time. Uh, and then I will email, email it to you with the summary of this, of this webinar, uh, with the link to the uh, recording on YouTube, and we will be uh, good. So just to let you know, uh, the results of the poll. Yeah, okay. I'm doing it right now. A couple of votes missing, but I am. Okay, and this is the results. And I hope you are seeing them. So we have 40% of CTOs, 15% head of engineering, 11% engineering manager, 16% software engineer. There are just 5% of non-techies like me, and there are 14% of the special ones. So the special ones, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, so let's kick it to the first round of questions. And I hope we can make it in 20 minutes. So um, I'll be watching the time and uh, I'm passing the floor to Marcel. So Marcel, Feel free to go. Thanks a lot. So, yeah, basically this was a crazy year. Everyone knows it, and um, I think the um, the challenges that we are facing are kind of like in chronological order of events that happened. So, looking back at um, you know March, April times, um, that was a time of uh, huge uncertainty, um, and um, I think that was like uh, the challenge here was to um, be be a good leader. Basically, uh, take care of your team um, and basically um, communicate. You know um, that you care about them and they are in a trustful environment here, uh, while you on your own basically don't know that much more than everyone else in the room. So that I think initially was uh, the uncertainty that we have had here. Um, then it was transitioned towards um, kind of like maybe an unexpected problem, but actually of working too much because people were uh, in my um, in my experience working uh, a lot. They wanted to contribute a lot which of course uh, led to the situation of uh, them maybe actually working too much and um, not taking vacation because it was not fun to take vacation. So um, that was uh, another challenge then. Uh, afterwards, um, when we got used to it, we had the feeling of increased distance. Well, we see each other just on faces. We are staring at screens all the time. So I think this was um, like is, is still an issue nowadays uh, that we have um, that we have distance. We're humans and we talk to screens basically. That's not the same. Um, onboarding people completely remotely, definitely a challenge in terms of our cultural aspect to let them know uh, like how it really feels, you know, to work with us as a team. And this brings me to where we are currently, like um, in the current phase, I think people are uh, tired of this whole situation of this whole year. Um, so they have um, basically everyone, not just in my team, but everyone has like this mental uh, tiredness and um, maybe some lack of uh, perspective that they have uh, gained throughout the year. Um, so this is basically, if I really sum up like all the challenges that we had, um, or I think that I see also elsewhere, not just in our company, uh, that would be it in a chronological order. I, I completely agree with a lot of the, what Marcel Marcel's said, and uh, I would like to focus on uh, how we were affected as, in, as a company of, uh, of people. And I think we were mostly affected in the ways of productivity and, and happiness. But we, we see that in, in, in the numbers also. So when I look at the numbers, uh, like how many people left the Vinted engineering team during the last year, that number is zero. And then when I look at uh, what happened this year, there are at least uh, three, uh, three engineers that left Fenton during this year. And those engineers are the ones we've onboarded uh, to the company this year. So for me, that's telling the story that uh, uh, when we were in a, this completely different working model from where we were previously, we were not able to adapt that quickly. So previously we worked in a co-located team. We were on, all in the single office and now we're all split between different homes. And that affected 
how we were able to hire people, how we were able to onboard people. Uh, that affected the productivity of the existing team, uh, which we know through a survey that we ran inside the company. Uh, we know that it affected uh, the work-life balance as uh, more than three fourths of uh, people in the same service said to us that they worked overtime to at least to some extent. And we even had a couple of burnouts. So we're trying to deal with all of that and trying to become better. But for us, the biggest change was in how we worked and trying to adjust to that while also facing the uncertainty and uh, the whole COVID situation was, uh, was quite difficult. Yeah, I think for us, uh, it was kind of the same. So when the, um, so the company I work for is really uh, focusing on the, um, the culture at the office. So the office process is like a really important place to come together, to share, to share knowledge, to work together, and also mostly for fun. So I think our biggest issue in the beginning was how can you translate the culture from the office uh, to home? So people are sitting at home, people actually tend to work more. That's something we also saw. So it's quite hard for people to leave the computer behind and move from maybe their kitchen table to the kitchen to make food or it's like a constant movement in around the home and people were used to working from home maybe uh, one or two days a week but like going there full time was really hard so we've been working really hard on uh, trying to get events trying to bring the office culture to home um, and luckily we saw just a minor percentage of people leaving that already worked for us uh, a really long time so it was sort of understandable that they left but so far we've been able to maintain a uh, most of the people that are here. And also we had our fully, uh, first fully digital onboarded people as well, which is also quite strange for us, but I think in general, we transitioned really quickly to, uh, to going remote. And I think that even helps us in um, appreciating even more the days that we could go to the office during the summer. And now hopefully again, uh, next summer. But um, for now, I think, uh, yeah, we managed quite decently. I totally agree with what was said uh, by my colleagues here. Um, so it's, I will focus on the specifics of, of our situation. In our case, uh, we're moving to uh, the remote work while before we were working strictly out of the office. So the majority of challenges were related to the remote work. So for instance, we had to learn the actual difference between the synchronous and asynchronous work. Uh, because everyone got so hyped out about uh, working asynchronously, but uh, this does not uh, work perfectly in all the cases. So we had to learn the hard way, the differences uh, between those two and how and when up to apply what. Uh, the other thing was, to, of course, about the communication, because the communication was totally different. Uh, it was limited in some way. Uh, and we have to learn this new, new kind of communication and to learn to use this communication, for instance, to express the ownership of the, over the particular topics uh, to avoid the effect of having someone dropping the ball. Uh, so we have to like establish completely new routines to establish completely new kind of even kind of language when we are speaking about the ownership, splitting the responsibility uh, to build some new conventions to just to make it more explicit in this new environment. Uh, the other thing is, uh, is a very important word, uh, which means a lot of different things for many people, which is transparency and entering someone else's boots. Uh, it feels quite simple and obvious if you know the people if you've worked uh, for a long time with them and if you have you know all this kinds of uh, uh, not non-verbal cues uh, when you communicate directly while being in the same room but it's much more tricky when uh, for instance you work asynchronously and use the remote tools to communicate uh, so we had to also uh, teach people and make sure they understand that transparency is everyone's responsibility and the need for transparency is not because someone doesn't trust them it's just uh, because we want the communication to be as effective as possible uh, yeah so com communication was a huge issue uh, the informal flow of information for instance was pretty much crippled so we had uh, you know to replace somehow the water cooler conversations and things like this which was very important in the culture of this particular company and uh, people have noticed quite quickly that the ease of the 
simple come and ask technique right now is much, much harder. It's, it's harder to start, the converse, to start the conversation right now when you don't see a particular person and you know, don't know whether this person is busy in the middle of some kind of conversation and so on. Uh, the other thing I will mention very, very briefly is of course feedback. Because feedback, as, as you know, it's the best when it's warm. It has to be continuous, as continuous as possible. And so we were, in, in the beginning, people were like completely uh, lost to how to provide this feedback in this new, new, uh, new context, in this new circumstances. Uh, and we also had to like evolve and learn in time how to do this efficiently uh, in, in, in the COVID era. Uh, I'm from a different space, maybe, because municipality is not uh, an organization, but uh, we did our homework and we started working uh, remotely from 2017. So we switched city uh, from Friday and it was no problem because uh, we were working twice per uh, week and we had uh, data, we have systems and the problem was not here. Uh, the problem was that we turned into extreme operations center of uh, capital of Lithuania and I was turned from uh, CTO to uh, data and innovation management and everyone in the city was asking uh, so what to do, uh, how we can help our schools to do remotely, how we can help our clinics, hospitals and uh, what is the prognosis of our data. So the main problem where to understand that you are in this group and uh, everybody is waiting some something for you. So uh, new IT system for schools, uh, data uh, about our illness and so on. So uh, after one month of working here, 24 hours, I feel like from, I don't know, second world war movies that exhausting and uh, other feelings but maybe going to it problem the main problem uh, was data so we thought that we are um, open city open data uh, capital but we understood that this data is not uh, exactly data what we needed to have uh, all necessary information and maybe we'll learn this lesson and we'll go forward. So everything else, it depends on, on companies in the city, of, of course, of culture. But if you are in the separation center, you have to understand that uh, every movement is, is uh, very important for every citizen and you have to uh, move in the right direction and nobody knows where is it the right direction. So maybe the problem was like that. Okay, thank you all. I am just uh, seeing that our CTO is actually uh, raising Ken. I have no clue what he wants. So uh, just a question to you, shall I, shall, I, shall I allow him to talk or? And I lost him. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. So uh, if no more questions asked, uh, uh, <laughs> mistake. Cool. So uh, thank you for uh, for the first first round. And having that said, uh, I may I ask. Think, thank you, Mr. Sebastian. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. So he completely <laughs> he, he disturbed me. It's on him. So once you finish, I have one question that uh, just came here. So I will ask it right now. So after after your round. Sorry. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I mean, all of what was said before, right, takes the box with me. It's like, uh, I think this one, one, one theme that we all have is that um, we are all, we're all having these challenges, right? So it's not like something that, that only one company has or one, one leader has. It's, that's, that's quite good because we can, we can exchange our ideas. Um, let me share also a few of them um, and start with one that I actually faced also quite individually by myself, um, which goes into the big question of, um, what is, what is company culture for, right? So we all think people need to be loyal and people need to be identified with the company. But as soon as people work from home, this kind of identification with the company um, erodes a bit, right? And um, to share my story, in the beginning of the year, when, when COVID started, I worked in a um, travel tech company, Omeo. 
And um, obviously travel and Corona were not good friends, right? So the company got, of course, into quite some problems. And at some point when all my teams, 50 people being in um, short work, right? So not working at all, getting only a fraction of the money they had before, including myself. We, I, I also asked myself, okay, I have a family. Uh, what, what, what do I do now, right? And I left the company um, after a few months um, and went to deliver here, which is one of the winners, of course, of, of, this, of this crisis. Um, and so did some others of my former team as well. So I think that's, that's one of the challenges that companies have, and it makes it just more visible that what, what is loyalty all about, right? And, and how can we keep people in times of crisis? Um, the second one is also kind of combined with my, my journey throughout the year, which is onboarding in, in these kind of remote times. I onboarded, I needed to onboard myself uh, which was quite an amazing experience, I have to say. So Delivery Hero is doing quite a good job here. But still, if more and more people join your team, and I hire at the moment around 50 more people in the next couple of months, um, and half of the team will be new, right? And they won't see each other um, for like maybe months or even years. You never know, right? I had one, one, one person coming from, I think, Albania. Uh, he's now in Berlin in a very small flat not seeing his colleagues, right? And only working remotely just because people need to move to Germany to work uh, for a German company. And that's, that's a big challenge. Um, and it also gives not just the leads in a, in a company um, or in the team, but also every employee some additional responsibilities of uh, how to actually connect with each other, how to be kind of um, listening more, right? Understanding each other, et cetera, all of, all of these things. Um, and the third challenge that I'd like to, 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 to share is all about information, communication, and how to make sense of, of things, right? So when you work together, what I love personally is having whiteboard sessions, um, problem solving meetings, right? Where you really exchange different opinions. Um, you, you go into a meeting, um, try out some stuff, go back into the meeting. You know, there's, there's kind of this consistent flow of information and idea ideation. This is not possible at the moment, right? So everything that was informal before needs to be formal now. And um, everything that was easy to do, right? Writing on a whiteboard, for example, is now kind of a hard thing. It almost feels like that's not the real thing, right? And um, even when it comes to, to communication, for, for, like I feel sometimes in, a, in the same like situation as watching videos or recordings of people talking the whole day to find this one little spot where, where actually something relevant happened. It's uh, actually what all of us do, I think, uh, going into Slack and following all these discussions that go on there to find something, right? So inf informal and formal communication got mixed somehow. And um, this, is, this is hard for managers, but it's also hard for every employee because it, it, it feels that, um, yeah, teams feel that this is good enough, right? So we have Slack, every information is there. So you just have to find it yourself. Which, which puts a different, or that's another uh, responsibility on our shoulders as leads to, to also understand, condense, and present information in different ways. So yeah, I can, I can talk forever, right? There's a lot of, lot of challenges that we made, but I think I, I keep it with these three uh, for now and let you, Camille, ask your question. <laughs> yeah, I will have two uh, re related to what you have uh, just said, because I'm just you know, sitting in front of this whiteboard here in the background. Uh, uh, are you guys using, for example, let's say Miro software to this kind of, let's say, virtual whiteboard sessions, or is it anything also as cool as Miro? So yeah, we are we are using Miro um, mostly for for not like two dimensional things, right? Like where, where a lot of people use spreadsheets still. Um, but yeah, again, it's not, it's not the same. It's better than, than, than spreadsheets or having a, a linear document, but um, it's, it's far from being uh, similar to what you have with whiteboards or just like uh, sheets of paper. Uh, and since we have still two minutes in this round, uh, I had one question uh, from the attendees. So I will just ask it open-end and please, uh, any of you uh, may answer. So the question is, have you noticed the uh, change in the productivity when people move from the offices to remote uh, mode? So I know it's, it's a big one, but any of you 
uh, please, um, please volunteer and you have three minutes. We can also come back to this in the Q and A session, but let's tease it a bit. Yeah, so I don't have a metric by which we measured productivity at Vinted, but what I can say is that we did a survey where everyone at the company answered where they feel more productive, whatever they feel more productive at the home or in the office. And uh, most of the people uh, feel that they are more productive or same uh, in the office. And there are less people who feel more productive at home. I think that's driven by a couple of factors. One of them is that most of the people, because they were working in a co-located office, they were not ready to have a productive working environment at home. And you just cannot magic it uh, by uh, clicking your fingers. Uh, there's, you need to actually invest in the, into making your home, uh, home office productive. And the other factor is that uh, you know, some of the people have uh, kids at home and uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, influences their productivity and happiness uh, very strongly. Yeah, I think the last point uh, was a good one, like what, what, what is your environment at home? Um, I think this is um, the, the main driver here, like how much of a distraction you are, because some people also told me in my team that they are less distracted and they can really focus, which is uh, which is super great. But I also know people that have families there and they want to like get out of home because they're so distracted by their kids. So I think that's uh, that's a very good point here. And uh, the other is um, like, what, what is what is productivity like? Is it like looking on the long term? I think we actually don't know yet because I think pretty much all of us has seen this more like midterm boost that we saw in productivity, people really working more than they should. But what does it actually mean on the long term? Because I think currently we are in a mode that is actually not so sustainable in terms of productivity and also health. I also want to say and to maybe agree with Mark. So we had two periods. One period was when we all were on lockdown and together in the one house. And other period was that when children can go to school and the productivity <laughs> was huge uh, uh, comparing even with the office because everybody was like, wow, my kids are out of here so I can work. And comparing these uh, two periods with our kids, uh, we decided that uh, a lot of people uh, realized that they are not doing real uh, capacity work. Some, you know, in municipality, a lot of politics things that going from cabinet to cabinet doing nothing. And they, we suggest, and then we suggested to just to have uh, extra work uh, board that if you don't <laughs> don't have anything to do, very important, you can choose from that one. <laughs> and it, it, it's working now. It's one, one little thought on, on that, I think, and I talked to a lot of people about that is, I think asking for productivity changes is not the right answer because I think, yes, as, as you all said, right, for some it's, 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 it's more productive, for some it's less productive. But the actual question, and this is what we can see long-term, right, is, is the outcome, better or the same or worse, right? Because of, of, a of a different kind of exchange, of a different kind of roadmap planning, OKRs, whatever, uh, do, we, do we have better products in the end? I think that's, that's, the, that's the big question that we need to ask because in, in the end, if all of us are, are more productive, two times, three times, uh, it doesn't mean anything when, when the outcome is not, is not better, right? So probably, uh, and this could, is probably one of the worst outcomes Sorry, lost my headphone. Um, so, um, you still hear me? Yeah, good. Yes, perfect. Um, so, I think if if all of us and all of our people work like two times, um, or have two two times the output that they had before, but the product stays the same, then we're burned out for nothing, right? So, that's 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 I think uh, if we stay same productivity and the product is same, then all is good. If we are more productive, but also the outcome. Uh, is, is way better than, than everything is good. But uh, just just looking for output increases is, is I think not the right question actually. Okay, then um, I would say that we might move to the second round of, of, of questions. Uh, we still have, I still have a uh, question uh, answer, I, mean, I mean asked by one of the attendees, but it's more I would say ready to the 
service um, businesses, which might be not so uh, relevant here, but let's see what happens uh, next. So uh, having uh, that said, I will move to the second round. And the second round is dedicated to the process. So, so how? How did you tackle the problems that we have just uh, discussed here? And this round would go in this order, starting from uh, Sebastian. So I'm, I'm giving the mic to him. In our case, we've decided that we'll start with the culture first. So we didn't want, for instance, to apply stricter control or anything like this. Uh, we just wanted, for instance, to start with re-emphasizing the principles. The principles we were not using or, uh, let's say, reiterating through that frequently before. Uh, why we found this important? Uh, we found it important because uh, the principles is something, is some kind of foundation that makes you able to make decisions on a daily basis. You don't have to have a rule book, a policy book, or something like this. If there are policy, if there are some principles, and if really the company is living by these principles, then it means that uh, everyone can confidently make a decision if this decision is backed up by a principle or two. So for us, this was important. It was important to give these people the confidence so they, for instance, don't have to double check, triple check everything because this is very inefficient in the remote environment. So this was like, I would say the foundation number one. Uh, the other thing was to start by uh, moving our culture or maybe just the daily type of work more from verbal to written. So we had to learn to effectively write down decisions, effectively write down summaries, effectively write, write down uh, actionable plans that we could share with the rest of the company or with the other teams. It's really important to have this uh, kind of practice with radiating the information to keep everyone in sync. And this is something that doesn't, uh, is, is not that maybe that, that important if you have just 40 or 50 people, like in our case, in the, if they are collocated. Uh, because then this information spreads out just by itself. Uh, but uh, if you work in the remote environment, you have to work on this. You have to learn how to radiate this information. You have to apply particular techniques. So visualizing the work, visualizing the plans, responsibilities, and so on, and making sure you publish it in a correct way was very important. Uh, I've already mentioned the difference between sync and async and where to apply which. So we, we, we are evangelizing internally about this. Uh, and we were trying to provide a very, very instantaneous feedback when we were seeing that people were, for instance, putting their own personal efficiency above the overall effectiveness, because this is the huge difference. And this is what happens. Uh, some teams have, have also applied the telepresence, so like permanent rooms where you could see each other, the members of the team, just to give some sort of an impression that it's almost like the old good times. So this was also a trick or, or some kind of a solution to the communicational problems we had. And of course, on the top of that, we've applied a lot of tools, a tools for collaboration, like Miro you've mentioned, so all kinds of virtual boards that you could use to some sort of brainstorming, uh, some kind of uh, knowledge management tools, because before we are using a very simple wiki, and right now we are trying to add some more additional, um, uh, I would say, enhancements to it. Uh, to, to like give us, a, let's say, extend our palette of, of, of uh, possibilities here. And, uh, and in the end, uh, the last kind of solution or kind of conceptual tool we've used was a very clear ownership model. Uh, we've used the uh, old good Rossi model, so responsible, accountable, consulted, informed, just to make it very explicit in, in the organization what kind of uh, responsibility regarding to the particular work item is related to uh, which person. Well, yeah, thanks, uh, Sebastian. I, I also, again, agree with, with, with these um, measures, with these tools, right? So we, we did quite some uh, uh, similar things. Um, I think when it comes to overcome these challenges, there's actually nothing new, right? So there's almost like it directs us to do the things that we knew before even better, right? Uh, one example would be um, the 
yeah, the value of local culture or team culture, right? So when in a company like, for example, Delivery Hero, which has 30,000 people worldwide, it's great to have to be part of such a company, but still with so many people and you being alone home, right, uh, at your desk, you don't feel as part of it. So what you really need is some, some team culture. And I think team managers really need to be trained in this, need to really focus on that to create this togetherness, to create, I don't know, a set of principles, to create a team charter, to, to have uh, kind of team all hands meetings where everyone can talk about their, um, their, their yeah, lows and highs in the week and all of, all of these, right? To create this, this sense of togetherness and psychological safety in a, in a local environment, because that's the only unit we, or that's the primary unit we have uh, as, uh, for, for each member of the team. Um, the second thing is I mentioned before, right, is this um, it, to, to manage this information overload. Um, I think it's not enough to just say, actually, every, everything happens in some emails. There's so many more documents and my robots and, and all of that, and people will find out. I think it's also part of our job as, as leaders to, to condense what was said and what was produced to, to come up with the right message and direct it into what, what we want to achieve as a team. Um, in different formats, right? Could be email, could be again some kind of an all hands meeting, or, or also even even in Slack. But I think we need to be really careful to understand okay, what the, what are the informational needs of of the people, and um, that's where I at the moment, because I said right, I'm new. We have a I, I'm leading a new organizational structure, hiring a lot of people, um, so I put a lot of effort into um, making um, information digestible for, for the people, for them to, to use it to, to get, get some chance, a sense of direction. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I think one, one thing that we, uh, that we should not forget and what we, where we also put some effort in, I think not enough is the fact that I think before when everyone was working in an office, um, I would say like for 30 to 40% was not work. 30 to 40 percent of, of, of things were like like people meeting each other at the coffee machine, going going to have a smoke, um, right? These kind of informal things. Currently, there's nothing like that. So I think even when you have a one and a half hour meeting every day where people don't talk about work but just about their personal lives and what they what their plans for the weekend or whatever movies is would would not steal time from the actual work day. Um, we do it actually bi-weekly, so we have a bi-weekly breakfast where everyone can join and we just exchange things outside work, um, mostly outside work, um, but also within these, these Zoom meetings where everyone is already getting nervous when somebody comes late for two minutes, uh, we should spend, I think, the first five minutes to, to, for some jokes or for some like asking what's, what's going on or so. Um, Sometimes when I have no meeting afterwards, I stay in, in a meeting to see if somebody else stays as well, so to, to, to get to a conversation. And, and, and I think these kind of things is, 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 uh, are important and us as leaders also need to be role models in that so that we don't start meetings always like, okay, now, now let's really focus on getting things done, et cetera, but leave, get, get some time in for people to be human beings and not just machines. Uh, when we realized uh, that we have more problem than hands, <laughs> like schools, or we need to teach teachers to do everything, uh, we created a Legion of Gediminas. It's a huge group of citizens that they have own uh, IT skills and can help to everyone. We, uh, we created call centers, we created uh, uh, data scientists, uh, drones, makers groups, uh, put it on Facebook. And now I just check it, uh, 573 <laughs> volunteers working. And when we had the situation that everybody was just locked, so uh, it's good to have this emotional possibility to work for the city. So we have these people working um, on the internet and uh, that was the biggest uh, amazing thing in the city that all these citizens uh, can help each other in uh, solving IT problems. So what you mentioned, all these slacks and mirrors and everything. So it's not uh, almost like that. It's helping with, uh, for example, uh, 
a group of teachers to understand how these teams are working or a group of uh, uh, people from that faculty to understand how we can upload data and this data need for our government so quickly do something. So these people are amazing and they are all already here uh, for this week and uh, last week and I hope that uh, um, during the uh, celebrating of New Year and uh, this is how we solved it. So we used people for other people with IT skills. So what I wanted to share with it. All right, um, thanks. Yeah, again, like a lot have, has been said already. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, basically it's uh, twofold um, that the one side is basically um, the humans that are behind everything, like, you know, um, as, as Bastian, as you said, um, and then there's also the, the company, what uh, what do you do on the strategic side? So I think for on the personal level, um, one thing that was, um, was definitely uh, required, and with Taledo it was already before like this, that we completely really put trust in our peop uh, people and uh, be there for them, of course, be very supportive if they need something, because it was very uncertain these times, but in the end still like uh, trust them, um, because there was for sure um, a feeling of we are all in the same boat and we are all you know not just within our company but in whole um everywhere basically globally that we work to uh, together on this so i think this was um that was uh, important to really like trust your people uh, over communicate in the end um, have a lot of meetings about things and um, that um, repeat things i mean sometimes i feel like even a bit stupid saying things so often but i think this is uh, important to just repeat things um uh, because yeah as i said we have information overload currently with all the different slack channels so um things need to be sometimes said again if you think they are important um and yeah i think in the end um th what makes the office so special is that um as, as has already been said like there are um small little rituals you know like uh, going for a coffee break uh, having a cigarette and we we here try to um like just do the same thing digitally um like having coffee coffee breaks um doing team events still you like playing quizzes online or these kind of things are very important uh, for new joiners as well because then you, they finally like open open up a bit more uh, having all hands and really like involving the people now that we even had christmas we did a nice little uh, Chris secret center where um we basically had our office as i mean we could do it because uh, most people still, still live here in berlin where we basically could tell them hey come to the office and then just drop it there or send it by post if you needed to and then we just exchange it here virtually which was really nice because we always did this every year uh, and and this really had a nice little uh, feeling for for everyone we actually have had gingerbread houses yesterday so people were building gingerbread houses and we shared this afterwards i think keeping these rituals um is very important especially knowing that some people as, as this current time and christmas are alone maybe cannot see their families at all um so um, i think it's important to keep uh, keep this in mind and um that's all the kind of like the human side and on the company side i think um, it's important that you just have a strategy to come come through such a crisis um and if you don't have one like develop one um so for example know what you want to do on the product side know what you what will you know what you can use in this time um digitalize uh, if that's possible um and um, if there's nothing to do you could still invest into technical depth for example to be prepared for after the crisis so um i think here it's important to have a strategy and communicate this but also be transparent if things are changing like um we work, for example, with quarterly OKRs, um, and um, this was a challenging year. So sometimes we just needed to really like adjust things because um, the world has just changed again. And uh, this was perceived also very nicely that they saw the management team is actually like capable of changing things. They are not like blindly following things. They really observe what's going on here. So I think this is uh, this helped us a lot. This mix between like personal treatment of people, understanding the situation, but also from a company, uh, be there for them and have a, have a plan. Yeah, not much uh, to add here, I think. There's a lot of um, things that have been said. It's like uh, very common in much companies. I think uh, yeah, one way was like getting used to tools that are already there, getting used to like a new way of collaboration. And I think most of all, what's most important is like communication. Like it's a lot of different information flows. And when you would have been at the office, you would just talk, go to a desk, say something in a room, and then assume everyone heard it. And online, it's a bit different. and especially the whole information overload. I think 
um, as a developer, you have like a, you have an email that you maybe don't read. You have maybe like an internal communication that you might or might not read. Then you probably have something like Slack. Uh, and then there's all these different channels, and then you still need to find time to to even focus at your work. So I think communication is um, important. But also make sure to not over communicate, and also find a way to communicate within the company that's uh, understandable for everyone, and also can reach the entire audience. So I think for us we. I think we solved most of the problems we had. Um, and then again, it was also because we we're still a very lean company, people easily adapted. Uh, so for us, it was quite easy to do, I think, within the uh, the boundaries uh, yeah, that we had or actually didn't have. Um, but yeah, so I think that the tools are important, the tools for communication uh, mostly. Yeah, fully support what my colleagues have said. And I will focus a bit more uh, on, on communication to what Roy uh, just mentioned. Uh, first of all, I, I would say that, uh, you know, I don't think that we fully tackled the problem. Uh, I don't think that it's something that can be fully tackled and solved. And at least for us, uh, for us at Vinted, we don't feel fully comfortable even now after, after months uh, after the COVID hit Lithuania. I think here I would compare the situation with COVID versus being in a distributed company. So when you're working in a distributed company, you can go out, you can uh, fly together to meet and in a COVID environment that uh, cannot easily happen. And at Vinted, we have a culture of co-creation and care. And we were used to expressing these uh, things and this culture in a co-located way. So for example, people would ask a buddy sitting nearby for help. And that cannot as easily happen in, in a digital way. You can ask via Slack, but you don't know if that a person is at, will, will respond in, in a minute or in an hour. And uh, I, I, would, I would also have situations when we were in the office when I could see my colleague being sad or happy or hurrying somewhere. And I could respond to that feeling. I could talk to that person. Uh, figure out what's going on. And that's not something that's easily replicated in a digital environment. So for us, the biggest challenge was not around formal communication. I think at Vinted, we had a, a lot of very different communication channels, Slack, email, internal messaging board. Uh, we, we did all hands even before COVID. Um, so we, we, I think we were pretty good even before COVID and formal communication, and we continue to do those things things, but informal communication was where informal communication and collaboration was where, where we found the biggest challenge. And we tried to solve that via digital team building events. Uh, we tried to schedule digital coffee breaks with people who just meet and chat about how the days are going. And consciously try to start the meetings uh, by just checking how everyone is, not just diving straight into the topic. Uh, and one, and we also try to create a sense of unity in other ways. So previously, uh, we would have uh, uh, on Fridays we would have a, a cake uh, day. So after lunch, we would uh, gather everyone in the company and uh, we would share in cake. And we tried to do the same thing by sending cake uh, to everyone's home. Mindauga, so I would say you had pretty a lot of guys to send over. Uh, correct. <laughs> okay, so uh, we are just on time with the agenda. Uh, uh, we have received a question from Constante. So we will um, dive into that in the Q&A uh, session. Tiago is also raising can. So Tiago, please be so kind. If you have a question, write it down in the chat. Uh, and we are going to dive into that in the Q&A session, which will be in around 20 minutes from now. So uh, moving on to the part number three, which is, uh, so what? So we would love to hear about the key lessons learned from this whole turbulent time we got through in 2020 and what 
you know, it taught us personally and maybe in the, in the business context, in you know, specific context. Mm, so in what ways we are smarter and better prepared for what's still to come next year or yeah, hopefully that would be the last year of this thing, but yeah, fingers crossed. So um, let's start from Roy uh, in the order as, as here, and then we'll move on to Q&A. So uh, to all the attendees, feel free to now uh, list down your questions and we will be tackling them in 20 minutes. Yeah, so last point already. So, so what I think uh, the key lesson learned for us uh, from the boom, we already knew that people are important. Uh, but I think being remote taught us even more that people are important, especially because it's harder to to really check how people are doing. So previously, somebody mentioned that um, whenever you start a meeting, don't dive directly into the topic. I think that's an important one because, uh, yeah, you want to see how people are doing. And if you don't see them face to face, it's really hard to see if they're doing well or if they actually aren't doing well. Um, so I think the main thing we learned is like people are important and you should keep investing in people even though you can't see them every day. And I think this is a very important lesson we learned. And I think we also learned that the methodologies that you can apply to uh, maybe your business case, to your company, like the way you structure your company is, based, is probably already some sort of lean agile approach. Um, you should really translate this in your communication, in your way to interact with people, in your way to adopt to new situations. Um, I think that's something we learned. And I think the biggest thing we actually learned is like, it's actually really fun to work with people. And um, sometimes people hate going to the office, people hate uh, going to work or doing the work or whatsoever. But as soon as you're sitting home every day behind your computer, you're gonna uh, notice how you really miss people, how you really miss a strange, spontaneous thing happening in your environment. And I think remotely we can mimic a lot of those things. We can still get close and personal, uh, but it will never be as, uh, as it would be in real life. So I think the main lesson we also learned is that we really, uh, have a special culture and we really want to keep fostering that and everyone's really looking forward to go back to the office um, but it won't be full time I guess and I don't think we're going to be a fully remote company because yeah we just like interaction too much um, yeah so that's a, that's a key lesson we learned and I think uh, that will be the same for a lot of people uh, so I'm interested to hear what the others uh, have been saying Um, we have here uh, maybe a few lessons. Uh, one of them is that we understood how important is a digital index of uh, human being. And we decided to create uh, even new program for every school from fifth class to uh, teach programming, hacking, uh, robotic and so on. And uh, but this is not about that. We understood that the most important digital skill is empathy. And uh, our colleagues were talking about that, but this digital skills about everything, or to ask how you are feeling, not in the group, <laughs> how we are feeling, everybody will answer, we are okay, but uh, person to person, manager to uh, other staff and uh, to understand uh, that motivation is going down and we are all tired and to understand uh, how your people feeling and how uh, hard they're working to say thank you or to say uh, small things uh, about how they are going good. So it's very important and it's uh, the most important digital skill. Yeah, I think for us, uh, very similar. Um, the, the human, the humans are humans, really. That's a big lesson learned. Um, I mean, looking back at this huge uh, um, historical time that we are currently living in, I think is um, uh, gives us also confidence to see that uh, we can tackle um, these uh, these issues and um, that we have um, that we have all it takes basically the, to um, to manage this. Like at so later, we have a small a smaller team that is really forming a super great unit, and I think that is uh, great to have such people behind you, and um, that gives uh, I think uh, like it's kind of like. Um, a feedback loop that on upwards by when you think like okay well we can manage things uh, so greatly even at such times i think this is uh, this is great to knowing for the future because um, there will be such things again and um, another one is we need to stay flexible i think 
currently um, times are changing so so fastly. Um, I mean, this is not the only thing that happened this year, right? We had this uh, this wire card crash, uh, like you know, uh, a Dux company uh, got, getting out of uh, getting out of this uh, stock market is it's crazy what has just happened this year, uh, and all the riots and all these things. So it's not just about Corona. And I think in these times, it's essential to stay flexible uh, with uh, with your strategy, with your uh, with your with your whole company, basically, um, because these things will just repeat. Um, it's just um, yeah, it's just, it's just the world that we live in. Um, but yeah, to pick up the first point again, I think the most important one is actually about the people that um, we can work remotely. I think we've all learned that, but uh, meeting in person actually make the difference um, because this is basically who we are. And maybe this is also like a good realization of uh, our current digitalization um, you know, that's happening around the world, um, that we find a bit more back to the roots, back to nature. You know, I think this is actually uh, a quite good balance here that, that or a mirror rather that makes us showing um, that we need to also stay human at some point here. Yes, that's what I think. Yeah, full, fully agree and would like to expand on one, one point you made. I think that at the start of, uh, of this year, when the COVID started, I think we had a big uproar of, we're all gonna switch to remote and to remote is now, remote is now the thing and this is accelerating the trend and we're all gonna be remote from 2021. Uh, I think that as an industry, we learn that uh, there are no, again, again, we learn that there are no easy answers and I can confirm that there are no silver bullets and no one approach is perfect for everyone. Uh, there are definitely trade-offs between different approaches between working remotely and working in an office. And while the technology is definitely improving, that enables uh, working remotely. And I could definitely see someday remote becoming very, very prominent. Uh, I don't think that 2021 is the year where we're all, when we're all gonna switch to remote. I think what is actually happening is acceptance of, of a hybrid model. Uh, if, even if you look at some of the headlines, for example, Microsoft is going remote. When you look at what they're actually doing, they're switching to a hybrid model where working from home is, very, is accepted. You don't longer have to be fully uh, you're for full five days, uh, for full five working days in the office. You can be at home for one of two days or three days. Uh, that depends on the company. Uh, I think that that's something we practiced at Vinted even before the pandemic. We, it was common for, for people to work from home uh, uh, one or two days a week. And I would practice that myself. I would spend Wednesdays as my no meetings days uh, to, to work on something else and I would not go to the office. But I think that this, this will be accelerated throughout the next year. And I think that at Vinted, we're gonna do more of that. And I think that other companies will also do more of that. I have to unmute myself. Yeah, um, also thanks from, from, uh, from my side for all the inputs that were that was given already. Um, I would concentrate on two, two things that are almost in line with what was said before, right? Uh, but probably give it another just another uh, perspective. I think one one key learning is that things that were important before, but probably not seen as so important, um, kind of showed that that they are important and they are here uh, about to stay, right? So um, when we when we look into what we all learned and what engineers learned, right? It's, it's technologies they change, architecture patterns they change. Um, communication tools, they change, organizational structures, they change, but what, what, what doesn't change is that we are all human beings, right? And what's, what's so interesting is that now that we are all remote and only see our faces and in, in these little screens, that um, being a human being with empathy, with like listening skills, etc., uh, is even more important. It also shows we can go into some kind of philosophical uh, conversation about artificial intelligence and these kind of things because it really shows who we are and what's what's important and what we need to concentrate on right um, but putting this into into the conversation into the discussion about hiring is is I think quite an interesting thing I'm I was always like uh, on this on that side of saying okay hire for mindset because everything else can be learned and I think that's what 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 we see at at the moment as well, right? If you if you only hire people who, who just want to code but don't don't care so much about their colleagues and the company, uh, who are probably not so interested in the product, um, etc., then we won't have success at the moment, right? So it's from a company point of view really 
um, hiring for hiring people who are actually good in working with other people, who are interested in working with other people, um, and engage also in like team growth and maturing the team, retrospective meetings, and all of these things, right? Um, and at the same time, those people that that work here uh, already, so we need to, I think, invest. They need to invest into into learning these things and 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 uh, maturing. And the same is true for people who are just about to start their jobs, who are in, in universities, etc. So, I would would really uh, urge them to, to to say, right, don't just learn coding, um, but really see how 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 can you collaborate with other people uh, globally? How can you collaborate with other cultures? How can you, um, as a as a man, work with with females in a team where ninety percent? I mean, right, all of these things are so super important, even more today. When, when this kind of natural factor of, yeah, we sit together, so there's some kind of human, human feeling is, is not there anymore, right? So that, that would be really number, number one. The second is a personal learning, which is that everyone sees this crisis from a different perspective. So there were times when, when I didn't work, right, in this travel company, um, um, I was kind of frustrated because my, my, my two boys were at home, homeschooling, working, uh, or not working, right? So, I was, I was not really positive during that time, but then when you talk to other people, they are positive. They see, feel, feel a bit more productive. They, 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 they see this kind of as an, yeah, as, as a good way to, 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 to work. Um, but also these things change. So really um, not thinking because you are positive or you are, you're happy about your current situation means that everyone else should be happy and vice versa is, is, is I think another learning especially for leaders and the higher you are in the hierarchy of a company, right? If you as a CEO or CTO think, hey, actually, I'm quite quite happy. Everything works well, works fine. Our productivity goes up. Uh, we have a good plan for next year. doesn't mean that, that the people that work for your company feel the same and other way around. So uh, if, if, if you're in big trouble, right, you can probably even count on your people because they, there is some engagement, there's positivity. So uh, create this di creating this dialogue is 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 an yeah it's an important learning i think um for the future and yeah the rest just uh, summarize as said before right um um condense information right so um bring information together and and um, make help people make people making sense out of it that's that's one of the biggest learning and i think it was true before even before uh, corona but uh, it's it's way more visible uh, today I think that my biggest learnings are again, again about the culture. So the company without the strong culture will have, uh, especially in such demanding times, and uh, problems with company's identity. So in time, people with, will feel more and more detached from the company. They will feel more like mercenaries. They will like uh, completely lose the perception that they are living people on the other side of those screens. So if you fail to create this strong culture and this strong identity, you will have trouble. Maybe not now, but as for sure in a few months time. Uh, the other learning, which is about culture, is that uh, not everyone is good for the remote. So a lot depends on how well you did the recruitment in, your, in the past. So this is what Bastian was covering, that if you are really looking for a mindset, then you are probably safe. But uh, if you are prioritizing hard, things, hard skills and things like that, you may be really in trouble. And especially right now, this recruitment is super important. So to understand and to properly probe the motivations of the individuals and what is the chance whether this can be aligned with the uh, priorities for the, for the organization and with the principles for this organization. The other thing I've learned is that, actually I find it's very interesting, is that uh, this demanding COVID times are a great test of leadership. And not just for, for, the, for the, I would say, main person in charge, like a CTO or VP of engineering, but also for all the leaders in the fields. Right now, I can uh, like completely agree with the common saying that one good sergeant is worth three generals. Because right now, for even for the best leader, it's so hard to reach everyone in this remote environment that without having some sort of ambassadors, which represent the same vision, technical vision, cultural vision, 
uh, in all the teams, uh, you're, then you're pretty much struggling against uh, something that is just not, not bearable. Uh, so it's, it's a great test for leadership, for your own personal leadership and for how well you've managed to grow the other leaders, like the next generations of the leaders. Uh, uh, the other thing, which is, I think what it was already mentioned before, uh, that uh, right now, all these new times, all these new conditions, they will, they, it will be never be like in the old days. So it's not translatable one to one. It's not like, uh, okay, we need some time to practice and things will be get back exactly as they were. No, it, they won't. Uh, so I think that we, will, we have a lot of uh, a lot to learn. We will learn the new way of doing things, which may be as good in terms of the final outcomes, but they will be different. So uh, the good thing or, or the important thing to remember about is don't, don't just stick to the old tricks. <laughs> Try to find the new ways to, to tackle the same problems or, or the similar problems. And uh, yeah, that's about it. All righty. So uh, thank you guys for this input. I would summarize what you have just said, uh, Sebastian, in, the, in this uh, last sentence that, you know, trying the same things uh, over and over again and expecting different results just doesn't work, right? So it's like once, once you learn, uh, you need to apply those things, especially this year, you know, on the go, on the fly. It's like, you know, fixing the plane while you're playing and the plane is about to crash and you need to fix it, right? So, so it's like this, this crazy little roller coaster ride. And so um, summarizing it, um, I would move gently to the Q&A and we have exactly 20 minutes, which is, uh, you know, impossibly uh, on time. Um, so we do have a couple of questions from, uh, from the attendees and I will ask it right now. And I think the one, the first one might be tackled by, by Marcel, since you guys from HR Tech and it's, let's say, uh, devoted to hiring, but wait a sec, I have it here. Mm. Okay, um, no, no, this is not the one, the one it's from here. So, okay, so this is sort of about benefits for, for uh, people working remotely. So are you and your um, engineering culture uh, considering to pay additional um, to people which stay remote? We added our remote package since May and we think it's good. What's your point of view on that? Um, it could be Marcel, it could be any of you. Um, so, I mean, we personally, we uh, haven't um, added any additional um, like package or, or benefits. I think what was said before, um, it was right that we are currently um, switching towards like a hybrid model. Um, and uh, this is what works, uh, what works best. So um, I think in the end, what, what we are looking for is really like people that are uh, motivated and um, that are, um, that are basically really like one, wanting drivers uh, forward. And I think this becomes uh, more and more apparent uh, that this is what, what is currently needed. Um, this is also what we see like on the market that this is the most important thing in the end, besides of course being technically like uh, competent enough to, to do the job. Um, but in terms of perks, I mean, uh, we haven't really changed so much here um, because um, in the end that that might be also the, the the wrong incentive because we are all currently in the in the same situation um, of course we will care, care about uh, people and uh, digitalize um, these um, these routines uh, that we had before this um, uh, what I said before about like having this virtual coffees and these kind of things um, I think that's uh, that's in the end uh, important but it's not that we have any additional incentivization in terms of adjusting to to the remote work currently and did any of you mean i mean uh, within your companies because it was let's say covered in the media that okay the, the tech the tech giants are letting people to work remotely and they are uh, applying something like sort of a bonus where people are getting an extra um, money to set up their uh, home offices. So uh, some people haven't had, you know, perfect conditions to work uh, at homes. Uh, so they were getting sort of extra, um, yeah, funds to to set it up. Have you have any of, of you practice it, or this this is not there yet? So Deliver Hero is doing quite a lot here. I mean, could say this is one of the at least in in Europe uh, tech giants, right? 
Um, so there's an additional bonus, right, to set up um, uh, the home office that, that everyone got in, in, in November. But also what, what they really do well is that it, that it make it, they, they make it easy for people to stay home. So even when, for example, you, you, you need a, I don't know, an additional keyboard or a mouse or some other device, um, there will be a delivery guy actually coming to your house, um, bringing it on the same day or the day after. Right. So it is really easy. You order something uh, in, in the internet or so, and then um, next day this, it, it will be delivered to your house so that you don't need to go to the city center and, and enter the office. Um, but even if you want to go the, to the office, we now have the software where you can actually allocate a, allocate a seat right? um, um, for yourself. Um, there's, there's still food available. And these, these kind of things is really um, make it make it easy to work in these times, um, even even if they are hard. So they take take away the stress quite a lot. Um, and in addition, the onboarding I mentioned this before um, also helps people who start to to have a great start in, in the company. So there's a lot of training for everyone uh, about the company principles and these kind of things, but also how to be. Um, how to be efficient in, in a remote work uh, world, right? How to get to know all the other teams. Um, so this this is quite a there was quite a lot of effort into into um, yeah creating all these contents and and helping people to yeah to feel part of it, right? And and to be to be to make it possible to work in this environment, but still feeling as as part of the company. I think that uh, it's a future uh, and it will come, I don't know, after one year everywhere. And uh, it will be like suggesting the company suggests to work in the real office at home or, I don't know, virtual reality office. And it depends on, <laughs> on your uh, uh, extra money. And I am not sure who will be the <laughs> highest one. Okay, so uh, the second question I've, I have here, um, it's also right to hiring, which, which you, you guys like. It's from Constante. So how has the current situation impacted your approach to hiring? Has, have there been any particular challenges or benefits? And it's open end, so feel free to volunteer. No volunteers. Yeah, I can do this one. <laughs> so we actually uh, did quite some hiring during the um, during the pandemic. Or pandemic is still going on. So, we're, um, but for us, nothing nothing really changed that much. We are still um, looking for people to join the office in Amsterdam. In theory, we even had people moving to the Netherlands uh, that were living somewhere abroad because we still feel it's part of our culture and we want to. Uh, people to live in the Netherlands, but also for, um, I think also for us, it's part of like contractual reasons because we still, there are like benefits for us if people work from the Netherlands. So I think that's something for maybe like an energy company, maybe it's different from like a company with uh, people all over the world. Like for us, we mainly target the Netherlands. Um, and all the conversations actually over the internet went quite smooth. So um, I think nothing in that area changed much for us. People really got used to doing it online soon. Um, the only difference you see is that people are requesting indeed like uh, extra allowances for maybe to uh, create a home office or at the office to provide lunch. So we try to uh, compensate that as well. So you can uh, get lunch at your home or try and find to create cooking lessons so people can actually uh, stay healthy at, from their own home because we can't control people uh, are eating pizza every day, which in my opinion, they can do, but it's not the most healthy solution. So as a company, we also try to uh, maintain a focus on that. But I think for hiring, for us, nothing uh, nothing changed. Yeah, maybe you can like um, share here a bit of um, Taledo's perspective in terms of uh, offer, offering what we see, what uh, clients are um, demanding. Um, 
so what definitely is happening, um, the process is switching towards digital. I mean, I think this is uh, this is obvious. But with this being said, there are some um, inherent, you know, challenges that need to be overcome, like um, storage of information um, in a in a central way, because there's so many different ways of communicating. Like some meeting might happen in Zoom, some might then in Google. Uh, you know, notes are being put uh, wherever in emails. So what we have uh, built here is um, like an holistic platform that allows everything on one platform and this is perceived nicely because um, you want to have all communication the decision process the feedback after each interview like on on, on one platform in terms of uh, collaborative recruiting and not, of course also like the uh, digital videos right so um, what we do for example is um, uh, video questions so that you can uh, post your questions dig digitally and wait for the feedback uh, whenever it suits the candidates so that you don't really need to uh, do this in a live fashion like we do here, which is perfectly suited for uh, screening questions like, you know, what are your strengths um, that uh, maybe ask for HR. So I think um, that might be some inherent challenges from like switching through from this meeting in person uh, through this digital process. And we try to like make this as smooth as possible. So that was a bit sharing from our like, you know, company perspective. In our case, the biggest challenge was the final step of recruitment, which is the trial day. This trial day was quite specific because it was supposed to give the candidate some kind of a glimpse into the company's culture to verify whether we have the chemistry between the actual team this person would work with and so on. So they had the opportunity to share the meal, to talk informally. And uh, in the meantime, we were doing this trial day, uh, providing access to our uh, parts of the code base, which is, I would say, strictly restricted. And uh, this is not something we would like to share over the internet with someone who is uh, getting trialed remotely. Uh, so there were plenty of the small annoyances to overcome and to tackle somehow. Uh, but still, we want to keep this trial day just to make sure that the person who is going to probably work with us in future uh, has as much uh, uh, of information about us before makes it, it, he or she makes the decision about joining. I would just quickly know that we had the exact same challenge as Vinted, as Sebastian just, just talked about. We also do tryouts for our uh, for all the positions that we hire for. And uh, switching a trial day to a digital trial day was uh, the biggest challenge among all the steps we have in the hiring process. And uh, many of the things that Sebastian mentioned, we, we encountered too. And I will have uh, one more, quite a general question, but um, like thinking back from the perspective of uh, what we know as a good old times a year ago, let's say, uh, when let's say your companies were, or our company as well, and majority of the companies, let's say over the world, were primarily focused on hiring people to their local local offices and you know with at least some 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 chance to visit the office once in a while have this sort of human to human con con connection and and, and and conversations uh to what happened uh from march when a lot of people were and a lot of companies were were forced to you know switch to this fully entirely remote uh, hiring process and hire and hire people uh, who you need, but you actually cannot meet for a couple of months because, you know, I mean, at, at least it's, it's not suggested to meet those people face to face, right? So you need to hire them, you need to onboard them, uh, and you need their skills and, and, their, and their expertise to, to put into the project. But well, the face to face is just not possible. So uh, are you sort of more open as, as the engineering leaders to, to onboard fully remote engineers to, to, to your teams or you are still missing the time when you will be able to hire again uh, based on the old rules. So, hey, come to our office, have this onboarding uh, onboarding uh, day, get to know us, uh, have a look into the, the code base, have this sort of feeling of, of chemistry, which is always, always uh, necessary. Um, or will this just change that, okay, we just need to um, be open to that and step into this fully remote and accept okay this is how we 
should stick if we want to achieve the goals that we, of course, have as, as engineering leaders. I think um, well, what, what, what we do is actually adapting to this new situation and thinking how can we make it as good as, as it was before or even better, right? So uh, one thing is uh, that, that I'm doing, sharing um, regularly how many people started or about to start because one thing that people felt was that empty seats were taken or the room became too, too, too dense, right? And this is, this is currently not happening. So when we have 10 new starters, nobody feels it because they are only sitting within their respective teams or even, even not, right? Because they are busy with, with, with their own stuff or so. Um, so sharing names, sharing um, uh, pictures of people, et cetera, is, is one thing also for the team that, 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 that we do. And on the other side, right, onboarding is, I think, as, as, as I said before, Delivery Hero as a company is doing a great job to make people part of the company as soon as possible. Uh, but then also for us as leads and for everyone in the team to just like help them, right? Reach out to them, have um, uh, pair programming sessions or so, uh, even even remotely. It's harder, it's it's more stressful, but I think it's it's absolutely needed to make people just being being part of it. And then this remote work um, can work well. If you forget about these things, right? Then we have just random people sitting around the globe or around the city in, in their flats and, and doing some stuff for, for companies they currently work for, but they also will leave uh, probably half a year later, a year later and be frustrated uh, most of the time. So, yeah. So um, we have one more question from Mayet and uh, let it be the last question so we'll be exactly on time. And this is uh, related to improving your team skills while remote. So how to improve, develop your team skills during a pandemic? Do you have a knowledge sharing sessions or something relevant? Not to uh, get your people too rusty. I believe that the same ways to which uh, were completely applicable half a year or year or two years ago are right now still completely applicable. So you can you can organize knowledge sharing sessions in digital way. There are efficient, effective ways to do this. Uh, what we ad additionally do, we have like established some additional bulletin boards. We've established some dedicated uh, channels on Slack uh, where people can actually share interesting content. Uh, they can share, for instance, what kind of, um, uh, I would say, educational resources they are using on a daily basis. They can, for instance, form uh, a dedicated uh, study groups uh, which study for the Kubernetes certification and so on. And so, on. so uh, I believe that uh, many things are, are just right they were before. It's just that we have moved all this educational experience into the digital space, but it doesn't mean that it cannot happen. It can happen pretty much equally uh, efficiently, I believe. Yeah, same. Not much to add here. It's pretty much the same, but it's very important, of course. Yeah, fully agree with my colleagues on that. I think that the, the, the way still work, they just uh, need to work in a different way. You can do all the same things, you just have to do them digital and be very, uh, I think a bit, you, you need to be a bit more conscious about doing them, uh, but you can still do them. Mm, okay, so we are four minutes before the deadline actually three now so uh, uh, wrapping it up um, I would really really like to thank all of you for taking the time both the panelists and and the attendees uh, to those of of you you are not there you're not hearing me but I will say it anyway to those of you who, who didn't make it we will uh, anyway reshare it again restream it and and put it uh, on on YouTube as a recording so you can uh, rewatch it anytime uh, you, you wish. Uh, also, special thanks to Marcel because uh, he joined the lineup literally two days ago as a as a as a, as a switch. Uh, you know, from... there, there there were more dynamic things happening this year, so <laughs> 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 it was great joining. I really liked it. So thanks for that. 
Yeah, so you know, this was pl literally plug and play, plug and play. Yeah, yes, so I, yeah. my, my graphic designer even didn't manage to uh, change the old graphic on LinkedIn. So, um, <laughs> you know, but it's MVP. Uh, that's the first episode. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so, so the next ones are still to come. Uh, I'm gonna or organize it. Uh, I believe once every uh, two months. So the next uh, episode should be somewhere mid-February or somewhere end of February and I will go to do it either about uh, fintech or SaaS so if you are one of those uh, engineering leaders listening to this or any of my network or your networks guys who you believe would be a great speaker uh, at the webinar like this who has the SaaS or fintech experience uh, I would really appreciate uh, hooking me up Mm, and uh, having said that, mm, I really, really, uh, once again, would like to thank all of you and uh, wish us stay bulletproof, you know, both in you know business context and personal context for, for next year. Uh, and I wish, wish you have a, a great rate. Oh, Vincent is asking something. <laughs> uh, or at least wants to ask something. Uh, wait a sec. Vincent, we have one one minute, so we will make it. It should be here. Okay, chat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, another mis <laughs> mistake. Okay, Vincent. So I, I I know you are volunteering for the next uh, fintech uh, CTO uh, webinar, so I'm having you on my shortlist. Uh, okay, then. So guys, uh, yeah, said already. Thank you for this. Uh, I will wrap it up in the email. I will possibly wrap it up in the in the blog post as well, so we will have everything in place, and I will share it uh, to the universe so people can also learn from what you have shared here. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks. It was really nice. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.